The first thing you should know about my friend Andrew is that he's skeptical. As befits his professional role as a data scientist, Andrew is programmed to doubt, to ask questions, to ask what if and understand if then. It makes him an annoying friend because when I tell him something, he usually questions it and I feel like I have to defend my statement. The next thing you should know about Andrew is that he's not cynical. He has a generally and genuinely optimistic point of view. He's certainly one of my best sources of hope and joy. And I don't have to defend what I say any more than is reasonable and logical and conscious human communication. He's rarely being contrary. He's getting to the truth in so much as we can ever do which helps me make better decisions and, quite frankly, be a better person. At this moment, I am more thankful than ever for people like Andrew who have my back. The first thing you should know about my friend Mrs. Philholm is that she's obsessed. She can't stay away from open mic comedy nights. Look at her Instagram. It's full of dark pictures of her cracking wise on stage with a microphone in her hand. She's out doing comedy almost every night of the week. The next thing you should know is that it's bleeding into the rest of her life. Two episodes ago, I mentioned to Mrs. Philholm that I was getting bored with all of the conversation about open mic comedy. Then we proceeded to talk about it for no fewer than 47 minutes. It's exhausting. But I guess I can forgive her because this week she transitioned from amateur comedian to pro. Congrats, Mrs. Philholm. Welcome to Half My Age, a weekly show in which a 25-year-old adult and a 50-year-old child help each other make sense of the world. Um, yep, that's right. I'm a professional comedian. And we're 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 only gonna talk about it for two minutes. Two minutes. I'm setting the timer going to talk about it either. I that's it. I I won a hilarious competition on Tuesday night and 10 American dollars. Thank you very much. That is all we need to say about it, truly. (laughs) Because I didn't, when I say won, I put that in air quotes because it wasn't actually funny. I was adorable and the hilarious people running the mic were nice to me. Okay, that's all. I'm a professional comedian now, 10 American dollars. Didn't even pay for one of my lift rides that night. Good night, Irene. (laughs) Irene? Mm-hmm. Is that from something? Is that a reference? What's mm-hmm. that? It's not... Uh, uh, you say Irene, and I think Eileen. I think, come on, Eileen. I know. I'm looking it up. Good night, Irene. Lead Belly song. Hmm. Yeah. Good night, Irene. It's an old Lead Belly song, and so that is idi- idiomatic a little bit. Good night, Irene. All right. There we go. That's it. Moving along. What do you got? Hey, what else Andrew. Do you got? Did you see anything good on your way to the dollhouse today? Oh, uh, did you? No, kind of. I saw a, um, I don't know, I'm, I probably should stop talking about the homeless people I see. Today, it's hard to stop. Today we're, we're a little bit later than we have been the last couple of weeks. So generally when I come out here at nine in the morning, the, the, the streets are still sleepy. There are people just waking up mm-hmm. and it's not, it's not too scary. Mm-hmm. And an hour later, uh, things are happening and people are moving and the, I don't know, all of the... All of the people who were sleeping on the side of the street have, you know, gotten up, done their morning calisthenics. And sure. Now they're, now they're out yelling at you. They've done their yoga. They've had their <laughs> coffee, their, their the fat-burning coffee. That's right. Uh-huh. Their they're uh-huh. bulletproof coffee. Yeah, bulletproof coffee. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And now they're ready to yell at you. Mm-hmm. Ready to bring it on. I don't know. I've seen a lot of stuff on the way. It's just been, I mean, yeah, everything around here, it's stunning. And... I'm not going to talk about comedy. I've seen a lot of homeless people out there. I, it's just funny because that is such a glamorous thing. And very often I'm like, well, I think it's time to move from this club to the next club because that homeless guy just showed up and his pants aren't really on. But the thing is, I know his name. <laughs> I just know it's time to leave. <laughs> it's a weird thing I'm doing out there. I got contacts. Yeah, yeah. How's your, yeah. How's your new sighted... It's a scene, man. Okay, I really like having contacts in. I am not a good com- candidate so, for contacts. Since you got contacts, I've seen you twice, and yeah. you've been wearing them neither time. Correct. <laughs> I know. Well, I'll tell you there. one reason. I am not a great candidate for contacts because I have to do the monovision. I have to do reading in the left eye and distance in the right eye, and it's not great for the computer. And both times you've seen me, I've been looking at my computer so that we can record a podcast. Mm-hmm. So uh, I got to figure that out. It may be that with my contacts in, it'll adjust to the computer and I can do that. I'm also on the thing where I'm like practicing extending the wear, you know, like six hours. And sure. Hours. Uh, I am a pretty much a spaz still about getting them in, but it's getting better. 
Getting them out is easy. It still feels weird and blinky a lot, like there's something in my eyes. It, I don't love it yet for driving, and I don't know if that will get better, like if my brain needs to adjust. I, I don't love it. I love it for everything else. I love it for being on stage. I love it for yard work even. Like if I'm working around and I don't want to have glasses on or just around the house, but then I need to read a little label or an instruction or see the hose connector, my, my reading is the worst part. So I love that. But I have reading in one eye and distance in the other eye. So far, I like it. So far, I really like it. Mm -hmm. um, since, since you're new to this and this whole monovision thing is, is entirely new, it's not just corrected vision, it's yeah. weird corrected vision. Yeah. Uh, do you have to think about which eye you're looking uh -uh. at? Uh, at first, and, and it was interesting, you know, you go to the little session that where they teach you how to put in contacts and how it's going to work. It was really cool. Um, and I felt like such a spaz. In fact, I said to the woman who was helping me, this reminded me of lactation classes. When you have a baby, they have nursing class, they have pro professionals who come in and just help you make sure your baby gets attached and latches on and, and teach you how to nurse. And it's so embarrassing and frustrating because there you are with your body should be doing something naturally and you feel like this professional has to come in and help you and she's probably never even had a baby. Um, but it felt like that, like this woman just felt so wise and like a, like a wizard because she can just <laughs> pop in these little weird plastic things in and out of eyes. Wow, wow, wow. How do you do that? So she, and I, I could tell she's a teacher and she's telling me the steps and how they work like she does a hundred times a day and she was so patient and kind. And one of the things she said is these, ultimately they work together. Don't, my instinct at first was, yes, I'm going to close my right eye so I can read and close my left eye for distance. And she said, really, really try not to do that. Try to get your eyes to work together. So when I'm driving, I... I am paying attention to that, but it freaks me out. Driving, I don't, it's a little creepy. It's scary a little bit. And I think it's just the disorientation of what am I, what am I looking at out there? Where, how, where is my point of focus? And it's, just, it's different. It's different than my glasses. So that is interesting. And I know that uh, they don't just do that with contacts. You can actually have your eyes lasered that way. When I was going through all my LASIK documentation, that was an option. Um, but fortunately, I, I, you know, not something I need yet, Yeah, but something I probably will need. Is eventually. that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a candidate for LASIK and I really am not a good candidate for contact lenses. And the doc told me that. In what way? Because I have, the, because, because really what I need is a correct, correction for reading. And you can't really walk around with a reading correction in your eyeball because then you really can't see anything else. You know, that's a very specific distance. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. so Anyway, but he said this is how we can try it. This is the way he recommended it. I got the toric lenses, which something it corrects my astigmatism. Huh. I don't really know what all. You that got means. some special eyes. I have some very special eyes, but they were, remember supervision until I was specialized eyes. Mm hmm. Specialized. <laughs> Spe specialized. Specialized. Yep. <laughs> I could see perfectly and better than perfect until I was 45 years old. So I've, I'm still new to all of this. But hey, it's good to have vision, and it's interesting with the contacts and. You've had laser, and now I have contact LASIK, and now I have contacts. Man, we are just all about vision. Twenty we sure are. Freaking 20 is what we're about, brother. We, we migrated. You know, we used to be the number one anti-homelessness podcast, mm -hmm. and then we, we became the number one foot fetish podcast, and mm -hmm. now we're all about vision. We the sure are. ocular health podcast. I mean, it's I, metaphorical. I want to apologize for just a, a minute ago when I talked about specialized, specialized, because that was treading awfully close to comedy, and I didn't want to go there. I know. We don't want to go there. It's awfully close to a joke. That's kind of why I paused. Like, Andrew, you're, you're really treading into the... We don't, we're not going to talk about joke telling. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Don't do it. Don't be so funny. <laughs> Turn it back. Dial that funny way back. Um, okay, so that was my follow-up, is that I got contacts. The other... Nope, that's about comedy. Not going to bring it. All righty then. Wait, you sent well, me a thing. You and I, we've got uh, we've got some big news in our in our little community. <gasps> we got. I forgot that we were going to talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we got we got people getting hitched. We've got uh, an engagement coming up. Delaney and I are actually going to a different wedding in September. It seems like uh, summertime in Colorado. The the sun's out, and so are all of the engagement rings and the the proposals. Cuffin and the season and the it's cuffin season. Cuffin season. Yeah, getting cuffed. Do you? <laughs> What do you mean engagements coming up? Engagements coming up. You well, I meant you just missed. Okay, up. thank you. I was just wondering because there was a recent engagement. There was a recent engagement, it, and it, I got a phone call about it. So did I. I know. You want to tell me about your phone call? Well, why is this? Who are these people, and why is it special to you? Why did you get a phone call? <laughs> I know. On the first that's day because it's your brother. And can we tell you their names? They said to me that we could talk about it. In fact, what they said to me is that the person who was going to decide if we would talk about it or not was Andrew. And I said, why are we giving Andrew all the power in this ish? Because that's the way it is. I know. And that's what they said. <laughs> um, we could say their names, right? 
I think so. Think so. Your brother Stephen and his up until now girlfriend Nikki and I introduced them. My son George pointed out when I saw him on Sunday that he was there when Nikki and Stephen met. Isn't that special? Yes! So I got to Yenta. I didn't really put them together. I just kind of provided the environment. And then when that was happening, I was real, real in favor of it. And so I got, well, I mean, I got a call like, that was that was an honor. Nikki called me. It was very sweet. And she said, I'm engaged. It was so cute. And they're a cool couple. I like that a lot. They're great. And I, I'm excited because Stephen is my older brother. I'm mm-hmm. one of three. Mm-hmm. And I'm in the middle. And this is the first time, like, there's there's a nice dry stretch in my in my last probably 10 years where there are no babies in my life. There mm-hmm. are no, um, you know, people, are, friends are just starting to get married. A nice dry spell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, now all of that, like, you know, school is behind me. Uh, the yeah. career stuff is underway. It's, it's all happening. And now it's time to time to have some life events like sure uh, like is, marriages it? and births and yeah engagements mm-hmm. anything that you can like take a picture for Instagram or Pinterest all of those events are happening in your age right now there's oh, a yeah. lot of Instagrammable moments in what's well, so your funny lives. You're I, celebrating I, every moment of the young lives everyone on Instagram right now is posting pictures of their engagement uh-huh. or their or their child. Or they're going on these these amazing vacations that they can go on because they're not engaged and don't have a child. Like there's, uh, there's so much going on, and uh. I'm I'm sitting in this shed sweating my ass off recording a podcast with Mrs. Phil. Holmes. It's not a shed. You gotta stop calling it a it's shed. A, it's a she shed. It mm. <laughs> it's a full on studio. And the reason that it's important that you say that is because it occurs to me I have a lot of people out there who think that they might want to record a podcast or become a voiceover artist. I can rent this ish out. So we need to stop. You absolutely Dishing. should. I mean, stop dragging this studio because it's a full-on studio. And I have a shock mat. Listen. Okay, that's a bad example. The <laughs> table made a noise. But usually in the past, listeners, I apologize because especially the past few episodes when I talk with my hands and was just even touching the table, every single time it goes, dun, dun, and I figured out what it was. I have a shock mount now on my mic. I have a cool new mic stand. I'm I'm getting profesh over here and getting ready to really work on some audiobook stuff. But don't call it a shed. I think I think that's a great idea. Renting out your your studio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Say what you will about the content of our podcast. The sound quality is excellent. Right. I sent you that feedback that we got. We're making people some sound snobs. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So back to the reason you were saying that is that everybody else is having um, Pinterest worthy moments in their life, and you're sitting in a beautiful professional studio making a podcast. Also, a something to celebrate in your life. Sure. <laughs> you're a maker. Well, darn right. You're. What was that noise? That was loud. Did you hear that? I did. It's possible that my are we under weed siege guys. Right now? Oh, maybe. Oh, you got that taser right there. Um, I th- my weed guys are coming today to spray for weeds, and there's probably there's some workmen here right now. Hmm. Yeah, there's a taser. That's for your girlfriend. It's it was it's her birthday gift, kind of. But I suppose I, I should probably should play with her birthday gift. You can totally play with it. It look, it's pink. It's my color of my glasses. <laughs> it's a flashlight to there. Okay. So, Stephen and Nikki, best wishes, and may you have a thousand years of wedded bliss. Um, it really was darling to me that I was on the call list. I mean, I, I'm sure you got called before. No, I got called before you. I got called by Stephen. Right. Anyway, I think probably, probably they had their own lists. Darn close to the same time. I was so honored to be on that list and to be that they, you know, game recognizing game, that that was a good, um, yenta ing right there. I hope they understand that I have to be the godmother of any future children that they have. I need to get this ish. I'm signed on the dotted line. I'm kidding. Well, I remember oh, I'm so happy for them. This is cute. The the last time we, we talked about marriage and wedding was not that many episodes ago when Tendra got engaged. Yeah. And Man. you you had, I mean, very quickly you got verklempt and you, you had all kinds of thoughts about, you know, uh, you, you wish you'd had a big, a bigger wedding in front of all of your friends, and what what kind of what kind of thoughts do you have if you were twenty years old right now, and you're, you're looking for a, a person? Maybe maybe you found a person. What what kind of advice can you give? What kind of words of wisdom? Yeah, that was also ironic to me. Poor Nikki Frick. She's calling the bitter, miserable, middle-aged divorce lady to say, hey, we're getting married. Maybe I'm a bad luck charm. Um, first of all, I would say to anybody who's 20, don't do anything. Don't make any sudden movements mm-hmm. or big choices in your life because you're 20. 
20. Mm -hmm. We've discussed that a lot. What about 24? I know. 25. I know. I don't know, man. I... I know it. It's a hard thing, isn't it? Boy, I... I don't even know. I don't know. I mean, I... I, I it, the whole thing freaks me out like advice i don't know don't listen to anything i say i why would you take advice from me i mean i guess i can look at like regret what would i have done differently sure, what, what wouldn't you do i mean i got married too fast i didn't get to know that person i think that what is maybe important okay we tend to get hitched because of love follow your heart sure and and you've told me that's uh, that's not a nice thing to say. No, it's not a nice thing when you say it. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to say in many, many situations. You can probably say it in a nice way. It's when you say it to me, I understand. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. He's saying he doesn't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> no, but right? I mean, we get married because of love and our hearts. And I think that probably there's a whole lot of let's use our brains to make this decision that we forget about that's very important. Mm -hmm. I mean... I feel lost about things like I don't think we were on the same page about a lot of things. And so I wish that we had been more conscious about those things. You say you had a, uh, you rushed into marriage. H how long did you know this person before you got married? Tell him I got married like seven months after we met and had a baby nine months later. I mean, for, it was for sure way too fast. Everybody was telling us it was way too fast. And of course, I was 26 and going, no, it's not. I'll fall, I'll, I'll, fools fall in love. You know, only fools fall in love. Go for it. Live large. It wasn't conscious enough. And we didn't, I, I mean, I wish, you know what? I One thing, here's a piece of advice. And I mean, I know we should have done this. I cannot imagine getting married without some kind of marriage prep or counseling. Or I mean, there's classes like that. The Catholic Church has many versions of it that like I grew up around. Mm -hmm. um, evenings for the engaged. My parents used to... Um, teach these classes or facilitate or whatever. Boy, I think that's a good idea. Boy, I think that's a good idea to go and talk about things. And, and how are we going to figure out our differences when we have them? Because I went into it so fast and so head over heels in love and kind of defiantly telling everybody else, you know, no, I know it's too fast, but we're perfect. It wasn't conscious enough. We didn't figure out what are your actual values versus mine? And how are we, how are we going to figure out stuff when it gets difficult and, trusting that we're on the same page when we weren't and I didn't know how to talk about it. I mean, boy, I, I wish I had done something. I wish we had done, read a book together. I mean, taken the love languages test together, which you and Delaney have done. I, we didn't do anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that seems dumb. Um, boy, Some people are coming at things from a whole bunch of different places. What makes us think, you've said it on the show, what makes us think we can just get into a relationship and know how to do it? <laughs> Yeah, you know? I mean, there's there's no uh, no license required. I wish I had read like I have in the past year, um, like books about myself and relationships and how things are likely to work and men versus women and things like that. I mean, I did that. Um, I did that tw ten week recovery class, the coloradorebuilders.com. By the way, they are sponsoring this podcast again. Thank you, Kathy Kahn. We'll tell you more details later. But I did that 10-week class, which is around a book called Rebuilding um, by Bruce Fisher. And I wish I had read that book before I got married. I mean, I really do, because what it's talking about is, listen, you, each one of us comes, we all come to the table with a sack of rocks, right? Everybody got baggage. There's a line in the beautiful musical Rent. I'm looking for baggage that goes with mine. That seems like a reasonable... <laughs> complimentary baggage. Correct. Matching luggage. <laughs> I mean, or not mac complimentary. I, I think that's a beautiful kind of way to look at it. Like, listen, every one of us is a broken person. So what are you bringing to the table? And I really like, right, whatever it is here that we've decided that we're going to go forward and live our lives together, since there's so much here that's positive, now let's maybe unpack some of the shit so that we can be aware of when we're going to trigger people and when we're going to, I don't know, being aware of how much I'm choosing this person based on what I didn't get in childhood, for example, or um, lots of those kinds of things. So could you hear my stomach making that noise right there? Yeah, I could. Isn't that something? I have been reading <laughs> about how to, I mean, I've been studying up on how to be a book author, a voiceover, right? And one of the things, one of the three top things that this 
this like guy who's a pro and makes instructional videos for pros is digestion. You got to make sure you eat and eat the right things because you can't have that. You can't have a stomach grumbling no while stomach you're recording gurgles. because the mic will always pick it up. Is it? <laughs> I'm like, hmm, I didn't. And he's like, figure it out for yourself. And he goes through all the things that voiceover artists like we all know. Oh, an apple will help control your saliva and dairy is bad and it clogs up your throat and da da da. And he goes, each of those things is true to some degree, but you just need to figure it out for yourself. If you're hungry and it makes your stomach grumble, you, you, you got to eat. And if if you eat, whatever, you can't eat certain things, you got to learn your body. I thought that was an interesting point. What was I saying? You were talking about knowing yourself before you rush into a relationship. Oh boy, oh boy. That's a tall order because do we ever. I don't know. I, I honestly think, okay, that's the other thing. I think that, the, oh, and I was talking about that book. Right. So that course was like a, a 10 week course of learn yourself and figure out what it is in yourself and your, you know, these, this relationship that has made it, caused it to end. And now you are in grief and now you have to rebuild from this thing. It's a heck of a lot of work on yourself. In fact, during that 10-week divorce class, Kathy Kahn, her rule, I mean, she's like, I can't tell you what to do, but my serious, serious suggestion is that you do not date anybody. You're working on yourself right now because you're coming through a tunnel of darkness. But maybe I should have done some work on myself beforehand. I mean, I thought I did. You know, I didn't. Sure. Thought I, I thought I did. I, 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 I entered it too fast, and we talked about it last episode. My tendency to get in my own way right at the moment well, I was right at the moment of either being a full-time actor in New York City. I mean, I was hustling that and having kind of a great time, but also I think it scared the hell out of me. I was very, very poor. And along came a man who could take care of me. And he was cute and nice. And I mean, you know, he's a wonderful guy. Still is. Um, but part of me goes, I think that was me scare I don't know wanting to settle down I mean I, I've talked about that over the years with people too like wow I settled down I settled you know I left New York City all my big actor friends are off still making careers in acting and somebody told me along the way an actor friend who is single said I know a lot of actors who mourn the children they didn't have mm -hmm. so I can't regret my choices you sure. know what I mean but there is something there that I go that marriage ended and ended badly and was fraught um, in many ways along the way be because I was hoping he would complete me, I think, or save me or whatever. I think that's the biggest trouble we get when we get into relationships is expecting that that other person will complete you. Well, it's it's interesting to think, um, you know, the, the decision you made when you were 26 uh, was was a not short-sighted decision, but it was it was only taking into account the things that were you were dealing with right then, Kinda. you know, right? So you you were poor right then, and you found someone who could who could mm -hmm. support you. Mm -hmm. And it, I, 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 there's probably no way to to account for all of the situations you're going to find yourselves in in the future. Right. But you get married to the person you know in the situation you're in. Uh, and then you're expected to have a 50-year relationship for longer, you know? And With each of you growing because people naturally grow. Right. And so struggling and, yeah, right. How can you, it's like, it's like we were talking about with education. you got to build critical thinking skills because you don't know what the jobs of the future are. You don't know what the struggles of the future right. are. Right. So I, I guess, I guess what you work on is like problem solving yeah. skills and. Communication. Like communication. Values. Nice person skills. Yeah, truly. And and also, I think if you took some kind of course or read a book together or whatever it is, learning how to uh, compromise and when to compromise and how much, you know, or or learning, because I love this person and I care about this person, I want the best for this person, learning that when I do that, that triggers something very deep in that person. That's a, I mean, trigger is a funny overused word right now, but that kind of thing, right? Like being respectful of that, uh, being able to sort out, that's her stuff and this is my stuff. Uh... Oh, I mean, yeah, communication. Again, values. I mean, Tal and I were never on the same page with money. I mean, just our attitudes toward money. And because I take a lot of responsibility for that, I have this adolescent attitude toward money, as we have discussed on this show. I didn't make that easy. But again, didn't have the tools to talk to each other about it in a way that made it okay. I think that we were not great ever at collaborating and at coming, like getting on the same page, getting on the same. We walked the same path. I feel like many times it was because I, I would accommodate. Like, like suddenly my life became about kid baseball. Mm -hmm. And not all of the moms and my friends became the concession stand mom and spent all of their summers for six or seven years hauling all that Gatorade. Da, 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 da. You know, and I felt kind of like, 
I was volunteered for that. You know, I was offered up because here we were a family. I, I mean, really, without a without a conscious conversation, like, hey, our life is about to become kid baseball. Like, maybe we could have been more conscious about that and maybe put... Another thing is boundaries. What are my personal boundaries? What are yours? What are ours as a family? Those are great things to discuss. We didn't, what, what the hell language did I have to talk about boundaries at age 26? I just really loved him, head over heels, and wanted to have his babies. And, I mean, they're good babies. So much of it was great. You know, that's the other thing. I mean, I'm looking at this just because it comes up as, yeah, what advice would I give to young married people? Oh, geez. I would also give them the advice... A little older is a little better. You just have more time to know yourself. Not always true. I mean, people work it out, but I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of cynical right now, Andrew. I'm always interested. There are a lot of couples from high school who knew each other in high school. Maybe they were dating in high school. Maybe they weren't. But they went to the, the same place. And I wonder if that gives them a better chance of success because they've known each other for longer or uh, a less good chance of success because it seems like they haven't been out and explored the other options. I know, know, right. Do you ever think about that? Oh, sure, of course. Do you watch any of those people uh, grow up and and see how how it ended? Uh Uh-huh. I have, I know, yeah, it's interesting. And sometimes it's amazing. I can think of a couple of of examples from my own childhood friend crowd, like high school Right, when they were dating in high school, when they hooked up later. And I think beautiful. I think both beautiful, lovely. It seems to be, that's the other thing. We see it on Instagram and Facebook. You know what I mean? What we present about our relationships. You just talked about how I, my Instagram is full right now of goofy pictures of me doing comedy late at night because that has been my absolute joy right now and it's just so funny. But there's a lot of crap that I'm not, you know, we get it. We're, we're curating our image. So they appear to be happy families. Oh, gosh, I know I have a cousin who's absolutely married to her high school sweetheart, and they appear to be one of the most beautiful couples I know. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, some people know themselves better. I blame it on me not knowing myself. I blame it on... And, and, you know, we were just talking about... It wasn't like I consciously went, I'm poor, I need someone to care about me. As far as I knew, I was happy to be poor and eat ramen and banana noodles until I landed my soap opera gig. You know, I was happy and felt like I had a tribe, and I did. Um... It wasn't a conscious thing that I went, I'm going to move back to Denver and give up my dreams because I need someone to pay my rent. No, but it's an attractive thing. It's, it was it's attractive, not, it's, that's it's right. It's some, something that you you didn't have. Somebody said to me, I think when I was like within the past year, an old friend, and I don't remember saying this, but he said, well, when you met Tal, you told me it was someone to watch over you. That's an old song, someone to watch over me. And I went, did I really? Huh. Because then I think what happened is that I became resentful of being watched over. I think I became resentful of mm-hmm, being cared for too much. And that's not fair, you know. Listen, I cannot imagine a real relationship again. And I'm sure that will all change and stuff. Um, but I can't imagine sharing my life with somebody again. Because I'm, I'm in the process of untangling and going, whoa, where did I lose myself? And where did he lose his, his self along the way? And sorry for the times that I expected you to complete me. That's a shitty thing to do to another person. Mm-hmm. Sorry for the time I expected you to fill my soul. Sorry about Chatting that. And there are some work emails. I've got a growling stomach, and you got well, you're working so much. You've got you're humping it, son. Yeah, I've got so right now my my life transitioned uh, pretty hard. From I, I quit my job and I took on this other job, and I didn't want to work more than thirty hours a week because I was going to have this podcast. Oh right, gonna, right. It was it was going to be a very cushy thing, and I was going to make. More than enough to maintain my my standard of living, uh, working few hours. There's going to be a lot of time with the motorcycle, a lot of time on the microphone, a lot of right. whatever. I forgot that that was the original plan because it's really different now. And now I'm I'm um, I have three clients. I'm working I don't know sixty plus hours a week, which is great because you know if if there's people who want to pay for your services, you got to make hay while there's sun in the sky, and it won't always be like this. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now it's, uh, with all of my clients, I've done a lot of the individual component and I found myself in tiny, tiny little managerial roles where I oh. have to, um, either, either help someone through their, their own work or I have to be a part of a conference call or whatever. And now it's just my, my mornings are booked solid of, of calls that, you know, I may or may not need to be a part of, but that's that's how I get paid. Is... Gotta be on, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, but good for you. You got a lot of work. You got more than you can stand right now, kinda. Yeah. And it's awesome. It is a it is a good thing. And it um 
it's fun. I, I'm definitely the kind of person who prefers to be busy over not busy. But that comes sometimes at the cost of my relationship. I was just thinking. And it's it's one of the... My, my busyness is my... I think it would be my, my primary downfall as a, as a mate, as a significant other, as a whatever. I, and, like, you, you get annoyed with me because my phone buzzes during the middle of our podcast, and I look at it. I'm not annoyed. Well, you should be. Yeah, I'm well. <laughs> And that, that, that only happens, uh, you know, six times a day to Delaney, and I feel bad right, about it. Right. But, that, I mean, right now that's kind of where I am. I know, and I thought about, I was just thinking that as you said that, because even back in the day when you were going to work the cushy three hours, 30 hours a week and have your, your work-life balance, we were building this show, and that was a lot of time. Now we're on pretty good schedule here, but that was a lot of time, and I remember thinking, boy, Delaney's probably getting annoyed because it was a lot, a lot of whatever, production, working on it at you know odd hours and stuff. And, th- right, so that's exactly the kind of thing that you got to figure out with your partner, is this an obs- you called me obsessive at the beginning of the show? You're kind of obsessive when you do things and can't pay attention to anything else. I say it all the time. I'm exhausting even to myself. I am. I am exhausting to live with. I am a hard. I must be a hard partner to have because I am too much all the time. I mean, I am. When I get obsessed, I get obsessed. And so if I'm working on the podcast, sorry, you know, I don't have time to whatever. Yeah, finding that balance seems real important, and talking about it now and understanding what it is that your mate needs and and have and picking a mate that can let you do that that understands yeah god bless it your your girlfriend as far as i can tell from my perspective is pretty generous and forgiving about the amount of time we spend joking around on a microphone and talking about this silly show you know she seems to give us the space for it and you give her the space to do her passions boy that seems like a good place to start mm-hmm. is it you're you're, wait, wait. you're appreciating the thing about the other person we do seem to work pretty well together. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, part of it is that we are conscious of these mm-hmm. these things we do that might annoy the other person. Um, and that definitely helps. But like if I was if I was trying to plan for a lifetime right now, I, I couldn't say whether I'll always be busy or whether I will find that that work life balance mm-hmm. because my my brain says it would be so nice to have the work life balance. but I'm probably most comfortable when I'm busy. Yeah, I bet you know? I'm a big guy who's gonna work a lot always. Always. And and finding that balance because that can get really that can get really toxic for a family, right? Or it can be, nope, this is a guy I I have a friend who works real hard and he says, I build so much vacation into my life because of family. This is a man who said to me at a he said at about age forty, I realized it, it, he said it maybe he said it was pointed out to me that I was not a very bit pleasant person to be around because this is a guy who has made a ton of money. He's been real successful. He's um, professionally has worked really hard and, and benefited from it, but it was making him miserable. And so he at about age 40, I guess, just went, okay, with the family, made the decision, got to save this. This is so much worth saving my marriage, my family. I'm being a, whew, I'm working too much in a way that's not making me happy or, or fulfilled. And so I'm going to build a ton of vacation into my life. And because I'm successful and have made this money, I can do. Mm-hmm. So that, but and I'm sure that was a lot of conversations with the wife. And the reason I think that is because he said to me, "It has been pointed out to me, <laughs> that I am not such a pleasant person to be around." And I was actually as a client, and I was helping him work on some um, kind of branding stuff and public speaking coaching. Actually, he wants to move branch into that. So that was a person going, "All right, what can I? I I'm, I've lost my joy. I've lost my." The other thing that you and your girlfriend have that I think is cool, because you always wonder, like, should we have things in common? Mm-hmm. Um, that is a, a big question. Is should we have shared hobbies? Should we have shared hobbies? And th- right. there are two schools of thought on this. One is the uh, you know the person who meets their mate on meetup.com because they both have a passion in uh, underwater basket right. reading. And then there's a, a buddy of mine. He's a he's a family friend of mostly my brother, and he sells he sells Porsches. And he used to sell motorcycles. He sold me one of my motorcycles, I think. And he just absolutely loves all things motorsport. Mm-hmm. And he picked his wife specifically because she didn't care about cars or motorcycles. That, that was that was a a way where he could. I don't know if it's get away. I, I don't know exactly the the reasoning behind it, but it's it's that's his space. It, it's more comfortable when he's got his own space. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that, but the thing is, like, I, yeah. And so that that's interesting. I kind of am on that field right now, but that's because we had very differing interests. But the thing is, I feel like you are supportive of Delaney's passion. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I think she is quite supportive of yours. 
She she totally is. When when we go paddle boarding, although this year she says she might try it, but she doesn't particularly like it. But she will be there and share the space with us at least for now. You know, she'll be there, quality time. She'll spend time with us, but it's not her thing. Um, I think that's fine as long as she has her thing, and she has. She totally has her thing. She's also very busy with her passion, in addition to her job, and you are very supportive of it. That seems to me healthy. I, I kind of. Oh, sorry. Is that your ringtone? That's my alarm. It's brick, it's brick house. I, I don't remember why it's ringing at 11 o'clock. That must have, I thought it was, I was like, oh, do I have to call into new talent night? No, it's something else. It must have been from last week. Anyway, either way, with relationships, you know, I mean, I think it's find your way. I think it's be as conscious as you can. We have, I have a lot of thoughts on that. But I do want to say, once again, that I am so thankful because I feel like I'm in a healthier place right now. So that as I'm out there meeting people and wondering what's next for me, boy, it's going to be real important to me to, um, yeah, be real conscious about it and to make sure that I have my space and you have your space. And we. it would be nice to be able to really appreciate another person and watch them really shine in their in their thing, you know, mm-hmm. and be happy for their success. I mean, I had that with Tal. He's a good golfer. I was always happy for his success in golf and hoping, um, you know, that that would become good for him. So I, I think that's a key. But anyway, again, the, one of the reasons that I feel like I'm even able to think about it and what what might be next for me is because I took that 10-week um, class, which a friend recommended to me, and I'm going to do our ad read right now, Andrew, because it's a real, it comes from my heart. <laughs> um, a friend of mine recommended it to me. I signed up that very night, as I have said, and I started it the very next day. It was a 10-week class. Colorado Rebuilders, are you or someone you know struggling with divorce? Colorado Rebuilders offers a 10-week class that supports people in experiencing all aspects of this challenging time. Social isolation, shame, fear, they're all normal but painful, and the Colorado Rebuilders class will help you move through these stages with other people who are struggling with the same loss. No kidding. Together, you can move into the next stage or chapter of your life with confidence, using insights on what happened and establishing tools for the future. At Colorado Rebuilders, we build hope. Visit coloradorebuilders.com to learn more about the program. Classes began like in September, I think, and here we are in August. Man, yeah. By the time this up. episode comes out, it's going to be. You better get in quick. Better get in quick. There, are, I think there are several options this fall. It's ColoradoRebuilders.com. If you are in Denver Metro or anywhere nearby, it's worth getting here. There are several options. Like I said, I think there's a daytime and even evening and a daytime class. Um, if you can't do it here, I really do recommend looking at that book, which is Rebuilding by Bruce Fisher, and seeing if there's a rebuilder course in your area. But Kathy Kahn, K-A-H-N, uh, teaches the course here. And I, she insists that part of this is the community. And I can't tell you how important it was to build that community. And it was against everything I wanted to do. When I walked in there, I was so broken. But part of the deal when you're recovering from a, a, a heartbreak is your, your, your social fear. You're, you, got, you got fear of other people and trusting and all of that. And she forces you to become in community with people. And I really thought that sounded like the nastiest, grossest thing ever. And I now... You walked in today and I was video chatting with two of the girlfriends from that class. I video chat with them all day long, pretty much. I mean, I, I, I don't know what I would do without them. And people in this, sharing this space as we go forward, who else wants to talk about like, hey, I just met this cute Lyft driver. You know, you don't want to hear about that, Andrew, but they do. So that's all very interesting. And I, that happened because I took that class. I recommend it highly. Thank you so much for the sponsorship and believing in us, Kathy Kahn, coloradorebuilders.com. Go sign up for your class and let the healing begin. I can't think of a uh, better advertisement than than the the couple times we've talked about it on this podcast. Like, it really did make a difference. Jeez, right. We could and, hear it unfolding over the winter, really, in the early episodes of the podcast. Yeah. And, and I can't imagine what it would have been like for you and for the people around you had you not taken the class. Can you imagine what it would have been like for you? I'm not kidding. Aren't you glad you don't have to hear about the cute Lyft driver? Do you want to hear about him, though? Not even a little. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know that anyone should take relationship advice from me, but uh, in the in the long run, I mean, I think that the biggest thing is get to know yourself and obviously, okay, here's the thing, duh, we all kind of know this, but it's easier said than done, especially when you're young. 
it's a big deal that divorce ladies say now, I'm working on myself, you know, I'm concentrating so much on myself that then when such time as it comes to meet the right person, I will be so centered in myself that they won't, I won't need them to complete me. We will feel very much both full people who come together and make a choice to live together. So that's where I'm saying like the follow your heart part of it. Love is so much we think of in the heart, but gosh, there's got to be some brain <laughs> helping you along the way there because it's not just a matter of passion and feelings. I got a, uh, a question for you. We met in Catholic school and a major part of Catholic school was uh, people telling us that cohabitation is bad. You should not live with someone. You should not be having sex with someone before you get married. Oh, let's let's be honest. I'm living with Delaney. <laughs> I think I think that uh, that's cause to go and confess. But I can't imagine I can't imagine being engaged to someone or marrying someone sight sight unseen, uh, never having lived with them and figured out how they feel about dirty dishes. I cannot imagine. I've actually been hearing other sort of podcasters and people in various walks of life talking about that lately. I cannot imagine if the first moment you spend together, you move in and write doing dishes and living with people is gross. I mean, I have made that it is clear. Gross. It's gross. I keep saying and I'm the worst offender. Are you? Boogers everywhere. Yeah, you're not gross. <laughs> you're gonna be one of the easiest people to live with in a way. Um, except for the fact you're not attentive to her. But no, I mean, I keep saying that. One of the dumbest things we do, I think, when we fall in love with someone is share living space together because I'm like, gross. I just, but that's, again, that's where I'm coming from now because I've never lived alone and now I'm enjoying living alone and I will really appreciate my own space. I am in a place of cocooning in some ways, so makes sense to me now that I can't see that. And like I said, things may change. Someday I may just meet somebody and go, wow, I want to share my whole life with you. I can't imagine it right now. So I'm coming from a cynical and broken point of view. One thing that I think is, um, anyway, to your to your question or whatever, to your point, yeah, I can't imagine not trying to live together and working some of that stuff out to see, are we able to compromise on these things or is this a person I just can't live with? Mm -hmm. I would like to know that before I sign on the dotted line. We used to have... Uh, so the class was called Relationships mm -hmm. relationships and Sexuality, and I actually got the award. I got the highest grade in that class. Oh, you got the award which, which isn't Relationships in, and Sexuality. Which isn't, isn't so much an indicator that I'm really good at relationships <laughs> and sex so much as it is that I'm extremely studious and an excellent student. Oh, I know what it means. <laughs> By the way, that was a great class. At your high, that you're, in your high school, it was one of the best classes you could have taken. That was a righteous dude who teaches that class. Oh, yeah. He, he was great, and he still he probably still is if he's... Yeah, I don't it's still know. Still great. Yeah. Um, but there were all kinds of statistics ab about how that was uh harmful to to a marriage. So you were you moving were more, in together. More likely to get divorced if you if you'd lived together before your marriage. Huh. Is that and right? I think the argument was it made the marriage less special. Like uh -huh. there there was nothing right. um you know, wait, waiting for waiting waiting to have sex until you're married makes your marriage super special and it, therefore you're you're more inclined to stick with this person forever. It's is, a is, sacrament. You is, must treat it with the holy, holy approach. Correct. Sex is a sacrament. Correct. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can tell, uh, the classroom, relationships and sexuality, is the only place where that is carried out. What? Where what is carried out? That uh, that idea abstinence. Yeah, they were they were digging for some of those some of those stats on how you're gonna have a better marriage if you don't live together beforehand. Mm -hmm. They were maybe looking at other sources than you and I might seek. Probably they, they're probably paging into a couple a couple pages of Google results, yeah. whereas you and I just take the top ten. And top ten. Good. Top ten. We're good. <laughs> move it. Move on in and sort that shit out now. I just can't imagine. I, I, I mean, I get it that it should be. Special. In fact, that's sort of something that people talk about always. I mean, whatever. Like, at what point do you or do you ever in a relationship when you live with someone leave the bathroom door open? You know how much of how much is comfort with be and and to me, I think I want a pretty high level of comfort. I need that other person to know that my body is my body and bodies are gross and we you know blah blah blah. Um, so that's a sort of intimacy that seems normal and natural. But I know there are people who are like, I would never, you know, I would never leave the bathroom door open because some things are kept special. Hey, figure it out Some things are kept special. Well, I mean, or private. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Like, meaning my sharing of my body with you is special and it's not going to be, you know, you don't need to watch me defecating. Dude, <laughs> I don't know. And some people, people have their own boundaries and all of it. But I just think I personally cannot imagine 
Listen, I can only imagine being with somebody in the fullness of a relationship if they live someplace else. <laughs> but that's me right now. Sure. But I can't, I mean, I don't know. That'd be interesting. Well, hey, Stats Boy, figure it out. What do you think? Uh, real stats, real talk, and get to the bottom of that truth with your skeptical, badass self and figure it out. What is the living together? I, I bet you've already done this actual research because you chose to live together and probably you figured out that made good sense financially and practically and everything else. We chose to live together kind of out of uh, necessity, necessity and ease in that at the time I was living with Stephen mm -hmm. and Stephen and his uh, now fiance uh, were, Stephen and I were living together and she moved in and like living with my brother's fine, but living with a couple is entirely different than living mm -hmm. with your brother. Golly, I remember that phase of your life. Wasn't that funny? So I found, I found a girlfriend right quick. Yeah. And New love was developing in your living room and you had to get out, go find your <laughs> own ish, man, right? A different train on out of there. <laughs> it felt like that though. So that, that's kind of how it happened is uh, I had roommates and, and Delaney had no roommates. And it was it was just awfully awfully convenient, and it turns out that she and I are actually pretty good roommates mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, really are. She she and I don't have we we've got compatible crazy, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And listen, like I'm saying, when I when I first started. Follow your heart or, you know, fall in love and make it the emotional parts of it. Fine and dandy, they can, but those are, that makes you a little crazy. It's the practical stuff. And I hear a lot of young people, dude, yeah, we're going to get close to something here, but you're about to turn 26 and age right out of your benefits. And so that is a practical reason to get married for a lot of people is, hey, health insurance, one person has a real job with real benefits. I go, yeah. God, that seems like a terrible reason to get married. Is it? Is that a really good reason to get married? I mean, if, that, that, if that's your only reason to get married and you're not even thinking about it with this person, I just could see that. I don't know. That seems like a very callous. That might be the trigger. That, that might be the trigger. That, that causes you to get married. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I can, and I mean, you got, you know, nowadays, I think from, from the young people that I hear about, like signing a year lease is tantamount to um, it's something big. Like if we've been living together and now we're going to up for one more year together. You guys marked that moment. I mean, you knew about that moment. Like, here we are. We're going to sign up for and another it, year. It was. It was, a, it was a very cautious thing mm -hmm. that that we did. Mostly, I mean, truthfully, I'm, I'm not on our lease. So, oh, interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm probably in violation of, of whatever mm -hmm. lease we're a part of. And it was it was very much, you know, we've, we've known each other for, for a decently long time. But I need to make sure that this rent is something I can pay if you mm -hmm. go away. Mm -hmm. that, that was definitely on Delaney's mm -hmm. mind when mm -hmm. uh, we were we were looking at signing a lease. And it's it's I don't know. I think that's important. I think uh, especially when a relationship is new, mm -hmm. you better not make any crazy decisions where you need the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you go in on a car loan or you you go in on <laughs> a lease, so. you you better be able to cover that yourself. I think so. I do. And I think that that idea, like I've, I, I sort of shared some heartbreak with a young friend of mine who they were about to sign up for their year lease and the boyfriend went, I'm out. And that was his trigger. You know, that was his turning point was like, I don't want to do this for one more year to me. So, so I, in my mind, I don't know if this is really a thing, but it's what I'm observing is young people going, okay, next big step. You want it another year? All right, we're gonna do it for a year. Okay, we did it for a year. Want to do it for another year? I kind of like that. Like in increments, we are making a commitment, seeing how it goes, testing it out. To me, it makes yeah. a little bit of sense. And then maybe at whatever point, and maybe it's six months lease, whatever, that cohabitating part, there is that certain thing built in there both, like you're saying, make sure I can afford this by myself. I also know young people who can't. I know a young person who wanted so badly to break up with her boyfriend and then they technically broke up and they had to share that apartment until she finished graduate school because she didn't have another option. Ooh. That sucks. Yuck. Right. <laughs> so that's it. If keep yourself from being desperate. Keep yourself, I would say that to young people, have options open so that you are not, yeah, relying on this person and their income or their house or their car or their toothbrush or whatever. Um, have your own Come into it. God bless the child that's got his own. But also, I kind of am interested in that idea of like, let's try it for a year. I think I know of a couple who are more my age, and she was going to move in and then kind of went, you know, not quite yet. Let's give it another year of this way, and maybe a year from now I'll move it. I don't know. To me, that kind of, it feels like the opposite of me in love. Like, no, don't put boundaries on my emotions. That's stupid, because boundaries are boundaries and you need them. Um... So I think that makes sort of an amount of sense. Like, let's put a, let's put some uh, goalposts here, right? Sure. Like, we're working towards a big goal. 
lifetime together and happy union, I guess. So let's put some sprints. Let's put in some sprints and then we'll have a scrum and we'll decide if we're going to up for another year and then what that means from there. I kind of like it. I also want to bring up another book that I have Listen to part of the audiobook. Oh, I could go back there and I need to be listening to more audiobooks right now for practice, uh, research. But anyway, it's called The Attached, The New Science of Adult Attachment and How It Can Help You Find and Keep Love by Ra- Amir Levine and Rachel Heller. Yeah, A-M-I-R Levine and Rachel Heller. You can find it, Attached. Uh, I've listened to part of it. It was recommended through from by Kathy Kahn um, in, in the Rebuilders class. And many of my friends from Diversity Club have read it and can't stop talking about it. Lorette can't stop talking about it. She gets everybody in my life and gets so sick of me talking about this book. The theory is, again, I have not read it, um, all of it. I've heard, listened to a little bit of it and done a little bit of research on it. The theory, I think, is that there are anxious styles of attachment and that the patterns therein cause some real wonky stuff in relationships and throw things out of balance. Anxious styles of attachment. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So if you have a secure attachment, it's kind of what I'm saying is, I think is the goal. Like, you are you and I am me and we don't need each other in crazy ways. Yeah, I don't need you to complete me. I sh- you add value and joy to my life. Um, and yes, I will learn how to accommodate and build this hard thing called life together, but 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 we're securely attached. I'm not I'm not um hyper worried about you and I'm not hyper- Okay. So the other the insecure types of attachment are generally at, uh, anxious versus avoidant. So I tend to be an anxious attached person because it's like, I like you. I want more of you, more of you, more of you. Do you like me? Do you like me? Let's be friends. Let's be friends. I mean, I feel like I'm an anxious attached person. I'm working on it, Andrew. But in general, even with my friends, you know, I mean, there'll be a thing like, oh, does that person not like me anymore? Or needing, like, I go white hot light of things, you know, like, I like you. Let's spend all our time together. Avoidant and attached. I think that insecure part of the attachment implies like that there is a, that that's not, I mean, it's definitely not healthy. That's an insecurity. Like I need check-in. I need validation. I need affirmation from you. Um, avoidant is somebody who specifically, like who goes and hides. I mean, specifically, if I come at you with my white hot light of, light of attention and like, be my friend, I like you, that person is going to actually feel that, receive that as awful, as mm. as scary and as like, Maybe it comes with conditions or maybe, I don't know. And I don't understand avoidant that much and I haven't read the book, but I'm not an avoidant person. So I, but, but here's the thing that's funny to me. Recently, I have a friend and it really is just a friend, but it's a man friend and I've known him a long time. And I think he's kind of an avoidant even as a friend. Anyway, I, I said to my, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hypotheticalize this a little bit. Okay. So I got a text uh, from a person. Sense. Yep. Or I no. got a text from a person and I was sitting with two other people. All of them are men. And this person said to me, we'll say, for example, hey, I'm going, I'm going to the zoo in an hour. And that was the text. And I was sitting with these guys from my work asking them questions about other things. And I went, these guys remind me of this guy. You guys, is this an invitation for me to go to the zoo? And they said, yeah, you didn't receive that as an invitation? And I went, no, because it's not. It's not a question. It's a statement of fact. And then they talked me through basically like what they called themselves risk avoidant, these guys. They're like, oh, no, the reason that I'm sometimes act act avoidant or don't ask uh, questions or ghost somebody on a text or whatever. The the reason you're not direct. uh Uh-huh. They go, it's just fear. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going, well, it's weird. And they were walking me through it, and I just thought that was funny. I'm think I think, I'm like I think this is like an avoidant person. Just when it gets too close or scary or too much or whatever, you instead of engaging or saying that's too much or whatever, you just kind of pull away and ghost and disappear and leave the anxious attached person going, "What the hell did I do wrong? What the, wait, you were you were all chatty yesterday, and now you I don't get it." It was very interesting to hear from these younger men who have girlfriends, and one of their girlfriends showed up, and we were asking her about, it, and she was just laughing like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." I get his attachment style. I get that's what he does. And these guys are also saying, we're super trainable. We don't, we're just dumb. I mean, like, they're going, we're clue. We, we, we just, I, I, they're like, sometimes I don't t- send a text because I don't know what to say. And I go, well, but but you have nice words. And you say, they're, I, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you. <laughs> but it was just interesting to hear from these, like, they call themselves risk avoidant. These guys just like, I don't know, a girl is always a risk. Whew. Um, and they both have lovely women in their lives and, and I think really happy relationships, but they're just telling me, oh, yeah, no, I'm avoiding. There are a thousand different reasons and ways that I avoid and, and, and 
hibernate from the relationship rather than engage in it. Okay, that's a kind of goofy example. I'm sure I'm not right on, but this book attached, and I think this perspective of how are you seeking love, okay? Some people are seeking love because they want affirmation. Me, I will show you every single day what I can do, my tricks, my funny crap, right? Like show off, look at me, look at me. Obviously, that's how I got validation. Probably it's how I got my validation as a child. Some people will will get your attention by telling you how sick they are or how broken they are or things they can't do, right? And you go, I always think that's weird because I'm the first one to go, what? We want to do a headstand competition? Let's do it right now. Versus people who go, I, I can't stand on my head. I have a thing that I was born with. And you kind of get a lot of information. That's maybe how they get their validation. They want to be cared for. They want to be seen as not strong. They want their vulnerability to be seen or something. Like, that's an interesting thing to me, like figuring out who, what you're about and what the person you love is about and how they how they respond to hard things. I think, I think there's a good book. I think it's a worthwhile book to look at, and a lot of people are talking about it right now. I find it kind of helpful to think about, is that person just super secure in attachment style or, or avoidant or anxiously attached? It kind of plays out when you're looking at relationships. And as my friends um, really do go out and date and kind of form new relationships after their divorces, it, it kind of plays out. It, it's kind of interesting. You're going, well, that guy is being a little bit anxious, and you are being a little bit uh, avoidant. Sure, I think I think one can trigger the other response mm-hmm. in a person. If mm-hmm. if if you let's let's just say you go in without a, a you're neither anxious nor avoidant, mm-hmm. and the other person is one of those. If they're anxious, it could cause you to be avoidant. Totally right, totally right. And I think that's what this book goes through. Is it? it you know, it, there's hope in all of it. There's hope in all of it. An anxious person can marry an anxious person and be happy, and an attached versus an all of that. But you're yeah, probably going to... two anxious people together? Sure. I think it probably happens all the time. Two needy people. Sounds like a lot of I love yous. Sure does. You know, or a lot... Of, yeah, I know. But the thing is that, like, the guy is saying, whatever your, your dynamic is between you and the person you love, there is hope here. It's just getting inside and going, that's what that's coming from. And for an anxious person like me, and I had a little bit of this in my relationship... For an anxious person like me, on on some level about things, sometimes um, an avoidant person actually hears a compliment as not a compliment. And that is baffling to me, and I can't quite figure out the machinations in your head when you receive a compliment as not a compliment, but I've seen it happen. When you talk about avoidant, I always think of that, I, I think it's an old saying, you know, I would never want to be a part of a club yeah. that would have me as a member. That's exactly what I was just it's, getting it, to. It's very exactly. much, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's a distrust of, how, if, if this place is so great, why do you like me? Why do you want me? Totally right. right? If, if it, you it, love me so much, you must be suspect. If you think I'm great, yeah. if you think I'm the best in the world, you, what's wrong with you? Clearly, you're a little broken. Uh-huh. That's exactly what I was getting at. It's exactly that concept of I wouldn't want to be a member of a club, any club that would have me as a member, because that club is suspect. I know, and that's attached, and I don't get it, right? Like I said, I love it when people tell me I'm great. Words of affirmation are my love language. I love that. And so when I come at you with my mouth words that are, you're the greatest, which, I mean, I do it for part of my living. I stand on the sidelines of races and cheerlead people. It's one of my favorite things. So that's who I am, and when I come at you, if you like me or you're afraid of me or you want that, that it sounds like the opposite of what i intend good to know and then i get to decide about that right like do i work on that is a person an avoidant person to that degree right now who can't even ask me a question i'm kind of like i don't I, i'm good i don't have time for that it was interesting hearing from these young women who are in these relationships with these two guys going oh it's totally worth it he's a great guy when he's here he's here when he's present he's present he's the most wonderful kind and loving man i just know that i have to tell him i have to remind him sometimes here are the rules you can't like not text me for 3 days <laughs> or you know and, and 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 you can work on it you can you can you can adjust you can adapt you can meet in the middle you always can relationships have to be about accommodating um Right, so I just think that that's a possible inroad. I would read it if I were getting if I were getting married, Stephen and Nikki. Maybe I'll get them that book because attached seems like a better book to give somebody than the book about divorce, rebuilders, rebuilding. Well, I I can't help but think that it's all it's all good. You, you know, know? It hey, w- good. W- wouldn't it be great to know the things they they want to teach you after you've had a divorce? Before you ever get one, I'm before, not you, before you even yes. get into a relationship. Yes, seriously, Colorado Rebuilders. That's exactly right. And Kathy Kahn says that. She says, I think about giving the book as an engagement gift because it, it, it just like, think about it. Don't think about it with this relationship. Go through it with the last relationship you had, which ended in heartbreak. Because the theory there, again, and same why I took that 10-week course, is 
until you heal your stuff, you're going to continue to repeat the same patterns. You just watch from your childhood. I mean, sorry, that's the way we do. And if, I mean, Richard Rohr, I quoted in my book, but this is, if you don't transform your pain, you're going to transmit it. And probably you're going to transmit it to your kids and your spouse and your dog, you know, and yourself. I mean, transform your pain, transform whatever it is that you have. All of us have stuff that is not a negative or cynical point of view. Everybody's got a sack of rocks looking for baggage that goes with mine. I mean it. You know, I mean, really, and, and I do think that if with that kind of conscious communication, we talked about love languages months ago, Andrew, right here on the show, and I kind of laughed and said, why did you why did you take that test? And you said, because of something in my relationship. We just had a little question we needed to look at, and you guys got right on it. And you you, you tended to that relationship as though it mattered and as, and as though whatever altercation here had come up could be solved. Right. I, I think it's important to remember that there there are tools and regardless of what your problem is, mm-hmm. somebody's been through it and somebody's written about it. Somebody's right. somebody's got a, a special quiz you take or, a, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. There, there's always resources to to figure it out. And if you are pragmatic and interested in making things better, then then go out and look because the stuff is out there. And you are. And in the Rebuilders class and in the rebuilding book one of the, the the relationship patterns i don't have the book in front of me but he talks about like various kinds of relationships that can be successful and one of them is like somebody who a more practical a more practical um transaction here you know like listen we live well together we're gonna make beautiful babies together we're always gonna you know i, I trust that you're gonna always bring in money or whatever it is like this is practical um and like you're saying there are all kinds of resources out there oh my gosh can you imagine the geez, Louise, billions and billions of words written and podcasts performed and all of this on relationship advice. What you said is exactly right. If you're pragmatic and you want to know how to make things work, there's plenty of opportunities. When I was getting married, I didn't want to be practical and I didn't want to avail myself of the resources, including people around us going, whoa, you guys, that's too fast. And we went, I talked about it last week. Same with people saying, why don't you go into advertising? Because you can't tell me because I am still kind of adolescent and crazy at those young ages. And I literally don't, uh, when I was in my twenties, I didn't much truly respect other people's experience. Sure. Sure. And I think that's that's what's made me super successful is I took advantage of having that older brother to to model the way. And he could he could go and he could succeed or he could go and he could fail, but I had the benefit of being able to watch. And you had the presence or whatever you have to take the notes and do it right. Because not everybody does that. Not everybody does follow the person that's most obviously showing them the path and mentoring and giving them an opportunity. They specifically don't pay attention to what's going on with their sibling, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you're, you're a weirdo in that way, but you're right. That is that is a lucky thing. And so that's my real advice to people is study up on it and understand. There were so many times when I was like mothering young children and you just felt beat up. And I mean, like so overwhelmed all the time. And I remember my friends and I going, no one told us about this. No one told us it was this hard. And I go, they probably did, though. <laughs> probably along the way they did and I wasn't listening and certainly when I got married I mean I remember having the thought I know this will not be sunshine and roses all of our days I remember having the thought even though life will get tough I want to walk that journey with this man I am committed to that and I I tried I mean I tried I, I was committed to that and and I just heard from another friend this morning who said and she's been she's like a year out ahead of me and she's going I still can't believe I'm divorced. And there's a little bit of that there where you just go, huh, wow, that's uh, certainly not what I was planning. And I didn't take that lightly. But um, yeah, I wish I had known more about myself and I wish I had known more about how to claim my own boundaries. A friend, you asked earlier about people who are, you know, high school sweethearts or whatever. And one person that I'm thinking of specifically did marry her high school sweetheart they appear to be really lovely. They have two kids. It seems great. Like kids are still pretty little. But she talks about how, I didn't know her. I've met her recently. And she talks about how, no, no, there were times that the husband was being uh, too much, whatever it was, working too much, whatever. She goes, I kicked him out for a week one time. I said, you did. (laughs) And so like that, I think she just knows her boundaries really well. I'm like, dude, this is not the way we're running this family. And so you got to go and you can come. Like I go, I didn't, And neither did my husband have that amount of like certainty to go, this is unacceptable. Let's figure this out. And I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. I tried a lot of 
I'm telling you my side of the story only, but you know, a lot of negotiating and trying and therapy and talking and talking and trying and making the different and trying and trying and trying to accommodate versus going, no, this is actually one where I put my foot down and shape up or ship out. I wasn't, I had nowhere near the trust in myself to do that. So maybe that's something that I admire about that woman because I just go, she had her boundaries. And, and I'm sure my husband also certainly regrets his boundaries. He let me get away with shit. I mean, it's not a one-sided street, but I just think that's part of it, to understand what you will and will not accept. Sure. Uh, what you will and where your worth actually lies and how that other person can shine a light on you or not. I hope you know that going into a marriage. I, I do. And I, like I said, there is a... There is so much opportunity in our culture and has been since certainly since I was a child for evenings for the engaged retreats. You want to know something else I think you people should do? Go to marriage counseling from the beginning because it's hard. Uh, go on retreats. If you, if you don't want to go to counseling once a month or twice a year, there's like retreats where you go away for a weekend and you focus on your relationship sponsored by churches or not. Do that. Do that. Because that to me is keeping it special. But that idea of keeping it special and <laughs> talking about bathrooms and whatever— Keeping something special, it's not going to feel so special when you've got babies crying and you can't sleep and you get sick. I mean, it doesn't feel special. But going, this thing right here between the two of us that where we started, this thing is valuable and we will protect it and we will work on it. And that is, and often that means it's, we need help. We need bigger than us. We need greater than us. Not because we're in crisis do we need to work on it because it's valuable. Right. If you're in crisis, it's too late. It's too late. It's valuable. So that class, you like you're saying— You need the oil changes all along mm-hmm. the way. And, the, and the, the, the nugget of what the Catholic Church is trying to teach us about sex and living together being an, uh, an intimate and holy thing, a sacrament, I, it's a cool place to come from. I just don't find it that practical in my life. I want to know if I bond with you before I you know, sign up for this whole thing. But that idea that this is a special, special thing, it's not— to me, it's not, I don't know, it's all of it. It's not just the sex. It's not just the, it's this thing between us where we're starting and deciding to build a life together. Life's going to get rough, right? No matter what, we know that. Hopefully our lives will be less rough than others and because of each other in our lives, it'll be better. Um, but I want a life partner here. I'm making that choice. That is a special thing and you got to honor it. You got you to gotta hold that thing like a fragile little egg, I think. And even, and it's very hard to do, especially when kids start coming and jobs start getting hard and, Parents get sick and all the other shit. It's, you got to just protect that thing. You really do. And we did not do a good job of that at all. I do. We just assumed that we knew what we were doing. And that is a real dumb act of hubris when you're in your 20s and you think you know what marriage is. Hmm. And when people would say, you understand, the passion will fade away. And I would go, no, no, it won't. No, it won't. What do you, what do you mean? There's no way. He's awesome. Passion's going to go away. This is Phil Holm. We just brought so much ruckus in this episode, but we're not going to end it on that downer note. <laughs> that's that's not a downer. That's hope for the young kids. Okay, all the, right. The passion will die. Come on, what kind of what kind of message is that? To that's you? not no. What I just said. Back up. The golden precious thing between you doesn't have to die. The passion, the se- sexy passion, dude. Your bodies start to f- it, come on. You get tired. You know that already. You don't feel as crazy googly-eyed as you did about Delaney even two years. Come on. That does. It's not a bad thing. And when people told it to me in my 20s, I received it as a as a bad thing. Like, no, no way, no way. Your passion is going to... Your love for that person, oh, I believe it still. I believe it can grow and warm the your life and everybody around you. But you have to keep that candle burning, right? And you have to understand that candle is not going to look so sexy. It's going to be hard at certain times, but keep it burning. I mean, that's let let your light shine, Andrew. But no, I believe it. And I'm so happy for Nikki and Steven. To me, that feels like a really good union. Hey, what do you think it's going to be? Is Nikki going to be a bridezilla? Nah. I couldn't say. What do you think? Now you're going to enter the next phase of your Pinterest lives. You're going to have the party planning, the wedding planning stage and engagement parties. We should have one right here at the dollhouse. I'm not even kidding. You should. You because should. Nikki and Steven I, love the dollhouse. I don't I don't want to go on record having said I can't say whether Nikki's going to be a bridezilla. She's not going to be a bridezilla. She's totally not going to be a bridezilla. No, There's great. no way. She's so practical and awesome and bad. She'll be kick-ass at it, though, wedding planning. Um, we don't have a date set yet, do we? Nope, not So kind of. no reason to worry about the wedding planning now. But it was very exciting. I also just got a text today while we were recording from... Um, 
a person a bit older than you, another former student from Mellon High School, just telling me that she just got her dream job in New York City. You go, girl. That makes me so happy, and I'm so happy to be um, on the text string for that, too. Look at me. Killing it. I'm getting these. Uh, I'm, I'm on the call list when people have big, happy <laughs> events in their lives. That could not make me happier. That's a true story. That's really true. That couldn't make me happier. So, I mean, it's rocket springing. Don't take advice about relationships from me. Do go to Colorado Rebuilders if you are suffering from a heartbreak. Doesn't have to be a divorce. Could be a breakup. Could be. But anyway, if you you get it. I talked to a woman actually at work who, yeah, she's been divorced a while. She had a a relationship with a guy and she really liked him and that ended. And she says, I'm still so messed up. Lisa, I'm still so messed up. And I told her about the book in the class and I hope she goes out and takes it. Check it out. ColoradoRebuilders.com. Classes start this fall. Get on it. Do we have any other follow-up? Not currently. Why? What, what, what do you What do you think? Well, I was just thinking. I sent you that thing from my uncle Bobby, who said, who explained the Lane crack brain. That's pretty funny. He told me that the crack brain that we have in my side of the family <laughs> is from Uncle uh, from Granddad Wally, my uncle, my 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 grandfather. That he was a that he was a um, fast brain processor too. And I think Bobby said something about face it after the meds wear off or something. Two a.m. ADHD can solve a lot of problems. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I know. I don't know. That was the only follow-up. We had good sound. Sweaty here in the dollhouse. But things are... Oh, you want to know what we haven't talked about? I did quit my job. We'll just we'll just leave that meatball hanging. I'm unemployed right now, everybody. We'll talk about that next time. Yeah. That's, that's fun to talk about. It is fun to talk about. I've been about. waiting to talk about that for I a know. while. Yeah. Stay tuned, viewers at home. All right. Studio audience. Goodbye, Mrs. Phil. Goodbye, Andrew. Andrew.